And welcome everyone to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled The World of Plymouth Plantation. And I'm joined by Carla Pastana, Distinguished Professor of History and Appleby Chair at the University of California in Los Angeles. Today is November the 18th. Greetings, everyone. Uh, this is our last session uh, before the holiday season really begins in earnest. My name is Andy Mink. I'm the Vice President of Education at the Center. And on behalf of my team, Jira, Mike, and Meredith, I want to thank you for joining us uh, yet again. Um, I'm continually uh, thrilled by how many of you are uh, loyal webinar attendees. It's great to see you in the room. And frankly, it was kind of nice to hear just a little bit about your own family traditions and uh, the ways that uh, that you as individuals are looking forward to the uh, upcoming break. And many of you, of course, talked about family and friends and food and, and relaxing. And um, while this will not be a webinar about Thanksgiving specifically, uh, it was certainly scheduled uh, this week and this day on purpose. And I'm hopeful that you do uh, share and feel a sense of community as you attend these events uh, throughout the year. In particular, I want to reach out and thank Candace for joining us. Candace is from Prince George County in Maryland. John's joining us from Michigan tonight. Uh, Justin's up in New Hampshire at the Mount Prospect Academy. Sarah, who claims to, and by claiming, I don't mean it's not true, uh, claims to have uh, relatives dating back to the Mayflower. Sarah, thank you for joining us from Santa Maria. And as always, we have a really strong Los Angeles um, cohort tonight. Andre, Rachel, Roseanne, and Shauna, who's at the Lomita STEAM Magnet School. Thank you again for joining us, and I do hope that you invite your colleagues and uh, folks that you teach with and the people you know in the education sphere to, to join us for upcoming webinars. One of the special things, uh, in my view, about the National Humanities Center is that we really try to um, and aim to create a culture and a community among the fellowship year and among the fellowship throughout the years. Uh, it really is intended to be a very special place where uh, some of the countries in the world's elite humanity scholars can spend a full year of unencumbered time doing their research and their writing and interacting with each other and you know, sort of taking a break from things, but more importantly, feeling supported by uh, the, the group of other scholars and other educators who, with whom they, uh, they work and they spend time with. Um, one of our primary ways of doing that is the Commons area, which has just recently been renamed as the Teachers Commons. And in the Commons area, every single day, we invite and expect our entire uh, staff and fellowship community to sit down and have lunch together. We've got a kitchen. James and Tom are fantastic about feeding us. And uh, we sit, we share the table, we share conversation. And you know, there's something, as I think about it, there's something about breaking bread about uh, sort of pushing away from your desk and your work and sitting down over, uh, you know, healthy and, 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 and food prepared with care uh, that really does create that strong sense of community. And again, while we won't talk specifically uh, about Thanksgiving all night, I think it is important to recognize that what many of you shared about the Thanksgiving break is that time at the table together. Um, it, there, there is a common feast here. It's a, non, it's a non denominational national holiday. And my goodness, uh, in terms of the polarized world we live in, it's kind of nice to pull up a, a seat and pass the oysters to the left, the cream corn to the right, and watch whoever's at the head of your table um, uh, carve the, the spiral ham or the, the turkey or uh, the duck or whatever else it might be. So, you know, as I enter into tonight's conversation with uh, Professor Pastana, it's I was reminded by um, by the time I spent just today with our Thanksgiving meal at the center and two years ago when I would have sat there with Candace Bailey, uh, who's our TA tonight, and enjoyed that same uh, conversation. Of course, all the resources that uh, we'll be working with tonight and we'll be sharing with you are found in the Humanities Class Digital Library. Uh, this library is free and open as an open education resource platform. And through your membership, your library card, you have access to all of the materials that correspond with all of our webinars. And that is, they are largely found in the webinar series group. If you go to that group, you'll see all of the webinars from this and previous years organized by chronology and then by subfolder with the individual um, session. And in that session, you'll find the readings that Professor Pisana provided, as well as instructional materials that we find relevant and other things that you know you can use in your classroom, again, at no cost and with a Creative Commons uh, copyright license. Uh, it could be that one of the reasons you found tonight's session appealing was um, was this sense of helping young people understand uh, 
the long ago and the far away. And I always found as an educator that, you know, sometimes that's something we struggle with as humans, as, as young people, um, you know, to, to try to find some relevance and connection with things that happened many, many years ago, at least in their mind, and often very far away. I would invite you to take a look at our spring webinar calendar. Uh, I suspect many of you looked through the entire session when uh, you first got the link in August, but maybe revisit it before the Christmas holidays begin. And you'll notice there are a lot of really compelling webinars around that sort of topic uh, that begins with Valerie Hansen from Yale on January 27th as she discusses the year 1000 and when uh, explorers connected the world and globalization uh, began. And then moving through the series, uh, uh, you can also uh, talk with uh, Chris Capozella from MIT about the ways that the United States and the Philippines built the America's first Pacific century. So I encourage you to sign up if you haven't, and again, share them please with your uh, colleagues and with your network. I wanna thank our Teacher Advisory Council, as always, for their contributions and continued goodwill in serving on behalf of the center. Um, it's important for us to have some sense of snapshot and some sense of what's happening in classrooms across the country. Of course, um, you know, in the last 18 months, those classrooms have changed immeasurably and being able to create opportunities and have conversations and provide resources that meet you where you need them to be is really our ultimate goal. And I appreciate the TAC's continued uh, advice and relevance in doing so. Tonight's session is an audio and PowerPoint only webinar. So you'll hear our voices, but you won't see our faces. But we wanna hear your voice too. And you do that in the audience chat box, which is indicated by red number two. Um, I'm sorry, red number three. And so in that space, you can uh, ask formal questions to the professor that I'll bring forward as the moderator. Uh, you can also continue to chatter and share ideas and resources and links and, um, and funny comments in the audience chat. And I wanna encourage you to use that to support the work that we're doing tonight. Again, I want to thank you for joining uh, tonight's webinar. It's titled The World of Plymouth Plantation. I'm joined by Professor Carla Pastana, Distinguished Professor of History at UCLA. I also want to thank Candace Bailey for joining us. Candace is a member of this year's Teacher Advisory Council, and in fact, the very first former NHC fellow who was applied and selected to serve on that council. Uh, she's a professor of music at North Carolina Central University, and I'm hopeful that I gained a little bit of street cred with her uh, when she heard my opening playlist uh, as we were getting settled into the evening. Uh, Professor, you're out in Los Angeles, as is many of our uh, audience tonight. Can you hear me? Hey there, Professor. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Hello, hello. To our audience, this isn't quite the same as Peniel Joseph a few nights ago <laughs> rushing in from his classroom, uh, but I do want to make sure that uh, we get Carla hooked up, uh, make sure nothing has gone wrong. Hey, Carla, can you hear me? We were talking at lunch today, again, over this big Thanksgiving meal that I uh, sort of bragged, humble bragged about. Uh, um, Hello. Hey, there you are. Okay. Sorry, Hi. we talked before and it worked, but then just now I had to <laughs> pick my mic <laughs> for That's some right, reason. Yeah. So. That's all right. I'm here Thank now. You, you sure are. Thank you so much for joining. And, you know, one of the nice things about working with an audience full of educators is that we all have that 15-second place where the technology uh, doesn't quite cooperate. Um, but we're good to go now, and uh, in a moment, I'm going to turn the, the PowerPoint slides over to you, and uh, really looking forward to, to hearing more about uh, the Plymouth Plantation, the world of Plymouth Plantation through your, your insights. But I'd like to start with just a quick question, if I may. Um, I, I'm wondering for you as, a, as an historian, how, how much does work like this get diluted or over... Um, if, maybe dilute is not the word, but certainly overshadowed by this big iconic term called Thanksgiving. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about it some tonight, <laughs> I'm sure. But, you know, as you saw from the opening comments, you know, I asked folks to share their traditions and their ideas, and everybody's got a Thanksgiving story. But how does that get in the way of understanding about this period of American history? 
Well, I do think Thanksgiving is part of a whole series of images that we have of early America and in particular early New England that shapes what a lot of people think uh, was the case. Most of those ideas come from the 19th century and mm -hmm. they were developed to serve a particular purpose at the time, but they've kind of, they've taken on their own you know, histories and they've, they've, they've developed their own kind of cultural resonance in a way that I, I find both really interesting, but, but also I, I agree with you. They, they tend, if not to dilute, they certainly shape people's understandings of what the past entailed. So. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it is a, a narrative that we tell and we celebrate and, and certainly now it's a, it's an industry too. And I, you know, I don't offer that as a sinister comment as much as to say, we have to unlearn a lot of things, it seems. And right. I, I suspect that in your own teaching, you probably have a lot of students who come in with assumptions and preconceptions and, you know, this kind of baked in long view of what this period is when maybe that's not the full story. Well, when I'm teaching undergraduates before I send them home on, on Thanksgiving break, I always explain to them what they probably did actually eat and that they should tell their families. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you I hope you share that with us tonight too. So well, thank, thank Certainly you. macaroni and cheese was not part of it. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you so much. Um, again, I'm going to turn these slides over to you. And as comments come into the chat box and questions flow in, I'll be, as the moderator, bringing those to your attention. Okay, great. Well, um, thank you again. I said at the start when you weren't hearing me, I thanked you for the invitation. And um, I'd also like to thank all the attendees. I know this is a busy time of year, and so it's nice to have people uh, to, to listen in and participate in this event. Um, I uh, obviously I wrote a book. <laughs> Here's a picture of the book, but I want to point out the dedication which I put on the on the slide here, which is um, I dedicated it to my teachers in part because of the sort of book it was and the fact that it was kind of jumping off from from something that I had learned as a grade schooler. Uh, and for those of you that are from uh, L.A., you might notice that, in fact, my first teacher is an elementary school teacher from my childhood uh, in the Valley. So uh, Ruby Marcus was my fifth grade teacher uh, at Ranchito. And the first person I remember, um, besides my own father, uh, encouraging my interest in history. And then, the, obviously, the dedication goes on to talk about my professors, my major professors at UCLA, Gary Nash and Joyce Appleby. I now hold a chair named for Joyce. Um, many teachers might have heard of Gary. He was very involved with um, K through 12 education. Uh, unfortunately, since this book was published, he has died. So uh, now all three of these people that I thanked are no longer with us. So. I've divided my remarks up into three rough sections, which is always what I do when I have a presentation like this to make, whether it's to students or anyone else. I don't know why. It's sort of what my brain does. But I'm happy to be interrupted at any time and take questions. And, um, you know, we don't necessarily, in fact, have to follow the slides. So I welcome, you know, people to, to jump in at any point. We have, um, it seems to me, images in our head of Plymouth, and I, I don't mean just us as, as educators, but I mean as uh, Americans have these ideas in our head. And they, as I mentioned already, they come largely from the 19th century and from uh, scholars, uh, politicians, descendants of the people who had lived in Plymouth, developing images that were uh, intended to give a sense of not only what Plymouth itself meant, but what, what the new United States meant. And, and New England in general, and Plymouth in particular, was sort of leveraged in order to create these images. So I want to go through a few of those images, kind of the main moments or whatever. One of them is uh, the signing of the Mayflower Compact. And I've kind of put these in chronological order in terms of when they are, uh, when they would have occurred in the early history of Plymouth. The Mayflower Compact on board the um, ship, the Mayflower, 
which of course at the time was not called the Mayflower Compact. In fact, none of the original records mention the name of the ship, which makes it sort of interesting that we so much associate that ship's name with this group of people. But this rather fanciful image of a far too clean and, and in fact spacious, in spite of the fact that it's a bit crowded, uh, looking ship's cabin where they're signing this document. Uh, so the Mayflower the signing of this of this compact or civil combination as they called it at, at the time was was emphasized by later people in the United States in order to indicate the birth of democracy uh the idea of representative government being so important in the early United States the birth of democracy and and the importance of democracy was was being denoted by emphasizing the compact Another element that gets a lot of attention in the 19th century, uh, and, and still from tourists today who visit Plymouth itself, is the idea of a rock, the landing uh, on a rock. This image is a little bit small for, for envisioning the rock, but you can see the figure standing on the rock and the boat coming from the ship at a distance, coming up to it to offload people so that they can be you know they can come on shore and this this moment with the rock and the the emphasis that was placed on the rock is is intended to indicate firstness like that these were the first europeans to come to new england or english people to come to new england and this is the first place they took a step onto land so it's kind of trying to capture that idea of the of the beginnings but it's also indicating as most of the images having to do with the landing uh emphasize the hardship that they underwent it's winter you know snow on the ground it's clearly very cold so this idea of coming to this empty land where they have to brave the elements is a sort of Im image that's associated with the rock the rock is actually the first of these various vignettes that becomes important uh, in the creation of the history the emphasis on it dates from the uh, 18th century in fact and uh, it became such an important tourist site. The rock was identified rather speciously by taking the oldest man around and taking him out to the beach and having him find the rock, point out a rock. He obviously in 1740 was too uh, young, you know, to have been in Plymouth in 1620, but he identified a rock and said, a boulder, in fact, and then the residents of Plymouth uh, attached some, you know, ropes to it and got, got horses to drag it out. They broke it. They put it on display and they put part of it on display in front of the, a public building. They moved it around various places and then they finally deposited it in this little Grecian temple. You know, this is much later. Uh, that's along the shore in no, you know, not in the original location. The rock was so important as a tourist site that people went and broke off chunks of it. And so here's actually it's in the Smithsonian, a chunk of the rock that was, uh, you know, collected in 1830 and labeled so that, you know, uh, I guess the, the, um, friends, relatives, and descendants of uh, the individual who acquired it would know what, what it was and why it was important. Another image that we have uh, dating back to this early period is the idea of the meeting of settlers with uh, a native man, in particular Squanto, um, who's the most famous of the of the early meetings and obviously if you're if you teach young children you know there are a lot of school of um books for children that that emphasize squanto coming as a friend and teaching the cultivation of corn so uh that that's not depicted here but this idea of meeting with squanto is another um important element of the images that come with uh, with Plymouth. Now here, of course, is the most famous, you know, single most famous association that Americans have, which is the idea of Thanksgiving. Uh, this 1875 painting, by the time this was painted, Thanksgiving was one of the first four um, U.S. national holidays. Uh, 
and is, you know, was well known as an important moment in early American history. So this, uh, you know, I mean, we can we could talk in extensively about the problems with this image from a historian's point of view. You know, the log cabin of a, a you know, of not really the kind of architecture that we know was in Plymouth. The native peoples um, appearing to be individuals from the Great Plains. You know, po very popular in 1875 as an as an image of Native America. Uh, once again, something that always bothers me with depictions of the 17th century: the people are surprisingly clean. You know, the whites of the of the apron, et cetera. Um, but the image itself is supposed to emphasize the piety. Uh, it also denotes friendly relations with the native peoples as uh, you know keeping in the theme of of the meeting with squanto and and it emphasizes survival the idea that they made it to the next fall they had a harvest they were able to you know break bread together with their native neighbors and they were able to uh join together and give thanks for this success that they had had in spite of the various hardships that they had encountered. So piety, family, survival, and good images, good relations with their native neighbors are kind of all captured in this image of Thanksgiving. And then in a, a sort of more general way, I just want to point out, in spite of this picture and the previous one where there's some bright colors, the general image of, of many Americans is uh, of a kind of um, dark clothing, very somber colors. If you see, you know, not only the, the hat and the buckles, which are kind of signature Plymouth images, but if you see this kind of dark clothing from this era, uh, you you know you it tends to signal that that is in fact what you're looking at that you're looking at um images from the you know from early new england from plymouth plantation and this i love this i got this at the huntington library where they have a collection i guess of of images off of of historic orange crates so this is like a you know, would have been pasted on the side of an orange crate for the Plymouth, for the Pilgrim brand orange uh, company in Highland, California. And, you know, interestingly, you're in uh, early 20th century California and growing oranges, which these people would have never had any access to, but you're you're selling them with this image of the landing again on the rock. Uh, and the idea of, you know, there being these uh, first settlers who are somehow iconically American. So these vignettes that uh, are associated with Plymouth, as I said, they they have a certain history to them. They were developed in certain at a certain time to make particular points, uh, and. I don't really have a criticism of of the images except the rock. Don't get me started on the rock. Uh nobody who's ever been in a small wooden boat has aimed their boat toward a boulder. So that just from a navigational point of view the idea that you would go up to a rock in order to be able to step off onto a, you know onto it is is a little bit silly. And in fact we have in the original records descriptions of them wading through the surf to get to the shore and you know the problems with then them having then having wet clothing and you know stockings and shoes and how cold it was so we know there was no rock and you know the idea that you would go and find one 120 years later and then make it the sort of centerpiece of your celebrations strikes me as a little bit silly but in general these images you know, they are what they are. They have interesting histories. Uh, you know, I didn't really want when I started thinking about Plymouth to, to argue with them. In fact, I found when I read all the source, all the secondary, you know, the historical works, recent historical works of, by recent, I mean, last 50 or 60 years that had been written about Plymouth. I found there was a lot of going around and around on this topic. Like, you know, the meeting with Squanto, for instance, 
uh, you know, being reinterpreted and criticized, you know, is, is an obvious one that's, that's, you know, been, you know, th these weren't friendly relations. Also, who was this man? How could he walk up to them and you know, them speaking English, et cetera? You know, lots of, lots of historical scholarship has gone into understanding better what went on there and criticizing the images. You know, similar with Thanksgiving, I've, I joked that, you know, I tell my students what they ate and it wasn't, it wasn't in fact turkey. Um, venison, in fact, is described as being the likely, uh, as being the, the meat that they had available for this multi-day harvest festival uh, brought to them by the native peoples. Um, and I didn't think, that there was much use in interrogating these images again and deciding whether or not they were they were correct. What interested me rather what interests me rather and how I've presented it so far is how they how they give us a certain meaning to early America. Um, early American history makes sense in the context of the US only if it contributed in some way to whatever the US meant. So these people wanted to think about, you know, if the U.S. stands for democracy, then this is the image that we're going to promote to, in order to say, you know, this is an important American value, one that we want to emphasize. Therefore, let's, you know, paint and extol and et cetera, the Mayflower Compact. So that's the the way in which I find them interesting, that they show what use the early American period had for people in the United States in its early years and what they were looking for. I mean, obviously the whole, whole idea of saying that Plymouth was first completely sets aside Virginia, which was the first surviving colony in what would turn out to be British and North America and then uh, later the U.S. And there's a fascinating battle between Virginia and Plymouth in the 19th century or Pl Virginia and New England in the 19th century about which one was uh, really the origins of the United States, which clearly New England won because these are the images we all we all know so well. So what I decided with the book that I wrote that came out last year was to go in a different direction. And that's what I would like to to talk about a little bit now. Unless, of course, there are questions. Andy, you, you do you know have the, any questions for me? Well, the, the questions are going to come in, but I, I actually would like to circle back to a comment you just made. And I'm going to say this uh, with the bias of being a native Virginian who grew up in the Tidewater region and <laughs> I went to Jamestown and knew nothing but John Smith and Pocahontas and didn't hear a single word about Plymouth or New England uh, as, a, as a young elementary school age uh, child. You know, in some ways, curriculum is also a way that we that we tell these stories and the curriculum that's that's being taught in certain places. Interestingly, I also know from my work in New England that they never talk about John Smith and right. uh, in Virginia in their curriculum. Right. But but I guess my question is. Um, when you talk about this, and I think you meant it both literally and also kind of playfully, this this competition, this, you know, uh, what was the first plane in Kitty Hawk or Ohio, Dayton, Ohio was the first <laughs> settlement right. in Virginia. Or, what, what is this thing about being first? Where, where does that wrap into, what does that tell us about uh, 19th and 20th, early 20th century American psyche? Well... I think that's a really fascinating question. I think I think this idea of setting okay, so historians today would not look back to the early 17th century and think in terms of people stepping off of a, a ship from England and establishing a new society. We don't think that we you know, we now think that lots of lots happens between 1607 when Virginia is founded and 1776 or, you know, 1620 when Plymouth is founded and, and, you know, whatever date in the revolutionary era you want to emphasize as the beginnings of the United States. But there was this sense that 
in coming to the Americas, these people were establishing a new society that intended to be the United States. So <laughs> I think in that sense, there's it becomes very freighted, you know, mm. where did this begin? So, um, you know, I think that's part of it. The other thing is, you know, when I say that, that New England won, I, I'm basing this on, you know, partly depends on how old you are and whether the curriculum started to get revised. But a lot of textbooks that were used throughout the United States were based on the ideas of um, George Bancroft, mm -hmm. who was the great, great 19th century historian of the United States, who was from Worcester, Massachusetts. <laughs> and he very much emphasized the New England story and the Plymouth story in the way that he told the beginnings of the U.S. And sure. he tried to promote, you know, a kind of, I mean, there were also people in New England at that time that were promoting national education system. Right. And, and that, and that, and those two kind of got attached together. I certainly learned Plymouth as a grade schooler in Los Angeles, yeah. Yeah. you know, and I did also know, a, you know, a, a little bit about John Smith, um, but I actually find that my undergraduates uh, know more, I, I would say they know more about Pocahontas and John Smith from yeah. Disney yeah, than, that's right. That's right. <laughs> than they ever did from, you know, anything they learned in school. And that's yeah. regardless of when I was teaching in Ohio or teaching now again in California. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. And we won't go down the long rabbit hole, too, of the way that curriculum matches uh, tourism. And, you know, if you right. if you require require kids to know something and you're running a, a tourist triangle in central and uh, eastern Virginia, then it's certainly helpful. But putting all that aside, um, what from an historian's perspective and as an educator, this notion of focusing on the first and this moment, this date, this day, this, you know, me putting my right foot out and standing on the boulder. What, what does that do, in your opinion, to the way that students imagine those already there, all the marginalized right. Native uh, voices right. that you right. know, are not waiting in repose for us to show up and activate the uh, <laughs> activate reality? What is what? How do you address that? Well, I hope you don't mind me calling you on this, but you just said us. And that I is something I, I try to disabuse my students of. Thank you. We were not there. <laughs> and we would not recognize the people who were there. Right. Either, you know, whether the Native people or the European people. They, you know, this is 400 plus years ago. They were very different than we are today. But we want to make them relevant to our lives, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in ways that, that flattens those historical differences. Um, you know, and that that makes a kind of easy equation between arriving in either Jamestown or in, you know, in Plymouth and, and then, you know, being in the United States 400 plus years later. So um, I think that firstness is something that it does a couple of things. When they're doing it initially, they're competing with each other. Yeah. They're competing with other European descended peoples who want their history to be more important. And Plymouth got pushed forward, not so much thinking about Jamestown as thinking about Boston. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> Plymouth was a little outpost that didn't, that wasn't very successful. Didn't attract very many people. It wasn't economically very sustainable, et cetera. When Massachusetts Bay is settled a, a decade later and a huge number of people arrive, Plymouth gets kind of overwhelmed. It sort of loses its independent identity. It gets, it doesn't get absorbed as a colony into Massachusetts Bay colony for another 60 years, but it, it ceases to be you know, to, to have a kind of totally separate identity. And so the idea that, yes, Massachusetts and Boston is the kind of dominant force in the region 
is one that the Plymouth people were very conscious of. And so I think in 1740, when they decide they're going to go out and find the rock, they're really thinking, you know, Plymouth is the, is the local place of most importance in spite of the fact that no one's noticing us now. So it was a kind of town boosterism in the original, you know, in the original moment. It wasn't, you know, they weren't thinking such grand thoughts as would eventually come to the fore of having, you know, a Founders Day that you, you know, had parades and brought in speakers and, you know, published the speeches about the importance of Plymouth. It started small as a kind of local, you know, we were here first and we don't want you to forget that sort of a moment. So, you know, and it, it, it makes sense in a colony that isn't thinking of itself as part of the United States that what happened in Virginia didn't matter, you know. I mean, like right. that's just another of many, many colonies that the English have, not only in North America, but in the Caribbean and, you know, by 1740 and in, in uh you know, in India and et cetera. So they're not, they're not thinking in competition at that moment with anybody, but you know, their neighbors. So it gradually develops that it becomes part of the U S story. Uh, but it's poised and ready to do that in part because it's been promoted in annual events in Plymouth right. from right. that period. Well, thank you for for going down that uh, that road with me, and uh, we can move forward now. But I'll, I'll continue to to collect questions, and we'll stop at different points to get them answered. Okay, great. Well, so I've shown you images that are probably not at all surprising, um, and you know, talked a little bit about their origins and their meanings. But what I was really interested in doing with the book that came out last year was thinking about Plymouth from a slightly different angle. And so I think a little bit of my own biography as a scholar would help to, to contextualize that. I began my work as a historian, as a graduate student actually at UCLA, um, working on New England. I was working on religious uh, groups within New England, in particular those groups that didn't have the endorsement of the, of the government, which wanted everybody to be a Congregationalist, which was in effect the established church in Plymouth from the time it was founded, excuse me, the established church in in Massachusetts and in most of the other uh, outpost, you know, most of the other colonies in the New England region. And there were groups from the 1650s, including the Quakers and the Baptists, who were illegal and treated like sectarian intruders in the early period even though they were eventually accepted many years later. So my dissertation and my first book was a study of that of that history of those two dissenting religious groups. Uh and that was a pretty typical dissertation topic for the 1980s in that if you were going to be a colonial American historian, you picked a colony that went on to become part of the United States and did something about its history. So my colony was Massachusetts, and you know that was my question that I was interested in. Um, but I noticed, particularly with the Quakers, that they were moving around a lot. They were coming to Massachusetts from Rhode Island often most immediately, but they were often also coming from like Barbados. And I, as a, as a graduate student, I hadn't really learned anything about Barbados. I, you know, I had just learned about the 13 colonies that went on to become part of the United States. So I started thinking in terms of, you know, where else are the English? And if we, if we aren't, if we're looking at the 17th century instead of the 18th century, and we're before the period of the American Revolution, then why would we treat the colonies that go on to break with Britain as a unit? Because they're not a unit yet. So I started becoming interested in where else had the had the English been, and what difference did that make? And I and I became interested in what we now talk about as the Atlantic world. That is, this is not a good map for showing that and that you can barely see Europe and you can't really see Africa at all, or maybe that little green is a tiny bit of of Af Africa peeking in there. Um, but uh, 
this idea that Europe, Africa, and North and South America were connected through all the interchange that was going on uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries, and that it became, it's not a self-contained world entirely, but it is a very deeply and increasingly interconnected world. So I decided to think about Plymouth in, the, in those terms. What did it, you know, what did this connected nature of of this world that they were a part of what difference did it make for Plymouth so I've I wrote a, a number of other books that dealt with other questions in Atlantic history one on religion Protestantism in particular and the creation of a British Atlantic world uh, another one on the what we call the English Revolution or the, the English Civil Wars and interregnum era or the wars of the three kingdoms um, that period in the 1640s and 1650s in England when there's revolution and regicide and et cetera. Um, what was the impact of that on these relatively new colonies that were that had been founded in the Americas? So one of my books dealt with that. Another book dealt with the English conquest of Jamaica. So I'd been off doing other things. New England had sometimes come into it, but wasn't really the main focus of it the way it had been in my first book. But then when I started thinking about Plymouth, I thought the way we do these little vignettes in a way takes takes Plymouth outside of history. They're like snapshots that don't necessarily have a larger context. They signed a document, they landed on a rock, they met a man, they had a meal, you know, but they're all kind of, they can all be painted into, you know, a single image that's that's then become sort of stands for things, but isn't really part of a narrative flow, doesn't have kind of causes and consequences in the same way that historical scholarship usually thinks of it. So I was, I, so I started thinking, what, what happens if you think of Plymouth as a connected place? That was really what I wanted to do with the book that I just wrote. And once you start thinking in those terms, it becomes obvious that, of course, it's a connected place. We don't consider that much, but in fact, you know, it's connected in a lot of a lot of ways. And one of the ways, of course, is that it is a colony having other colonial uh, colonial experience as are other places at the same time. So whether or not it's trading and people are traveling back and forth with these other colonies, these colonies become uh compare have comparative possibilities at least you could think in terms of you know what was going on there as opposed to say virginia which was a colony that already existed at the time that plymouth found, was founded uh in fact the people who end up in plymouth were going to northern virginia they were aiming for what's you know probably around delaware right now which was part of the Virginia land grant, and they were going to be a sort of semi-independent settlement with under the Virginia patent. And they they don't land, they don't make it there. They end up in in New England, and they end up staying, and you know just deciding they're going to make their stand there. But Virginia was an existing colony with already with a government and settlers and trade, and so you know it it. It's obviously earlier, whatever we want to say about the firstness images, but it's also, you know, a place that's having its own experiences of attempting to do something in the Americas with lar largely with uh, English people interacting with native peoples who are who are already there. And so it, it gives us some way of thinking about comparisons and connections. Uh, another colony that already existed was Bermuda. Uh, or what they called Summers Island. Uh, at, it had been founded a couple years before uh, Plymouth was founded. And then finally, in the first decade in Plymouth, colonies are established in the Caribbean. English colonies are established in the Caribbean, among them what they then called St. Christopher's, what's now called St. Kitts. Um, and so there were other places at the same time that English people were going to that might be connected to Plymouth in various ways, but certainly could also give us some grounds for comparison. Plymouth is fortunate in a way, uh, or historians of Plymouth 
are fortunate in that there are a lot of really fabulous sources about the very early period. Uh, there's a um, a pair of published accounts, first-hand accounts, uh, a relation or a journal, which is often referred to somewhat confusingly uh, as Mort's relation. Uh, Mort wrote a George Mort wrote a short or uh, two-page preface once the once the uh, manuscript came to London uh, to be added to the front of the press. Of, you know of the publication, but because he signed his preface, uh, and no, and most of the other pieces were not signed, it came to be associated with his name, even though he was not in Plymouth in this early period. So, uh, this relation or a journal tries to give uh, accounts of the various events that happen in the first year, written by, as I said, it's unsigned, but it's in different segments, written by unnamed people. Lots of scholars have tried to figure out exactly who. Edward Winslow probably played a big role uh, in the writing of it. Um, and another one, Good News from New England, which was in fact uh, published by Edward Winslow, written by, as you, uh, I think you can see on this slide, it says by E.W. Uh, that is Edward Winslow, who was present and who was, uh, you know, in fact, on the Mayflower when it landed in 1620. So we have these fabulous accounts written by people who were there, and that makes it somewhat unusual. Now, Virginia does also have a lot of writings um, not from the very first moment uh, of this nature, but it does have a lot of John Smith writings about what went on. Uh, but he's, you know, one individual who had a particular perspective and by the time he was publishing an ax to grind. So, you know, it's, they're not exactly comparable. Um, so a, a historian is, you know, has the benefit of these kinds of sources, which are really excellent descriptions uh, slanted, obviously, in the direction of the um, of the settlers, but often de describing interactions with Native peoples. Uh, scholars have gotten pretty good, particularly Native scholars or scholars uh, who are experts in Native America, at reading them with an eye for what were the practices that that these. In, you know, new arrivals would have been observing among the native peoples. You know, they may be misunderstanding what's going on, but they they're presumably seeing something. And if we know more about native culture than they did, can we understand what it is that they're describing? So they've they've been good resources for both ex describing the European experience, but then also for describing what was going on from the native point of view as well. So I use these sources um, and wanted to think about connections and about what I had learned about the Atlantic world over the previous many decades of working as a scholar uh, to think about Plymouth. How would you think of Plymouth as a connected place? I did what my dissertation advisor advised me to do, which is I read everything, not only a relation and good news, but other things that were produced in the first decade or so. And I just started making lists of connections various ways I could see them as connected. And then I tried to sort them into um, different categories as ways to think about how to organize the book. I ended up with three broad categories, different kinds of connections, connections through people, uh, connections through ideas, and connections through things. And I'd like to talk about those each in turn for a little bit now. For people, I ended up identifying uh, six different categories wives, transients, traders, escapees, servants, and privateers. And I have a chapter, a short chapter, on each of these categories um, as a way to think about how people were connected. And I, I'd like to just give an example uh, from the transients chapter, uh, a somewhat surprising example, I think, for people who know uh, New England history well, and that is the, the figure of Edward Winslow. Winslow is the only person who was on the Mayflower, of which we have a contemporary portrait of all the you know other paintings, et cetera, that were produced in subsequent centuries. None of them are actually based on 
uh, the, the, you know, the actual people themselves, um, you know, portraits to life are not available other, except for the case of Winslow. Um, Winslow is a fascinating man. I could tell you lots about him, but let me just point out a couple things. He did not travel to Leiden in the Netherlands with uh, William Bradford and the other people who, whose dramatic escape from uh, England is described in Bradford's great source, great manuscript source of Plymouth Plantation. He came later to Leiden, and there he joined the church, and he married. Uh, he worked with William Brewster, who was a church elder and who briefly had a publishing venture in Leiden. And when the group was starting to think about coming to the uh, English-American uh, colonies that were then getting founded, he was involved in the negotiations. Uh, he and his wife traveled on the Mayflower. She died shortly after, uh, and he quickly married uh, another recently widowed passenger, uh, Susanna White, who is famous in history for having been the mother of Peregrine White, who was a child who was born in in Plymouth shortly after it was founded. Uh, they went on to have children of their own, and he served as a uh, governor of the colony, an agent representing the colony in England, uh, a negotiator with other people who were in the region. He wrote, as I said, probably parts of a relation or a journal, and certainly uh, good news from New England. He wrote other polemical tracts over the course of his career. But the reason why I think of him as a transient is not only because he went from England to Leiden to America, but also because he then goes back and forth to England multiple times, you know, demonstrating this connectedness that bound people in Plymouth to other places. But then he ends up staying in England, though his family largely remains in Plymouth. Uh, including his his wife and his children, he goes to New England and becomes very involved in the events there. Um, becomes a key, you know, he's a polemicist. He's advocating not only for Plymouth but for Massachusetts Bay and its interests to the government. And he is selected by Oliver Cromwell, who was then uh, Lord Protector of England, to go out with a fleet. Uh, that went to uh, the Caribbean with the idea of conquering the Spanish Americas. He goes with what's referred to as the Western Design Fleet in 1654. Uh, they arrive in Barbados in early 1655. They spend three months there, and then they sail up to the island of Hispaniola, which is today the Dominican Republic and Haiti, uh, and they... Um, attempt to conquer that island away from the Spanish. They are rebuffed uh, in, in embarrassing ways. They, there's reports of cowardice. Um, I tend to be somewhat sympathetic to their plight because they land in the wrong place. They don't have good supplies. They march around the island finding befouled wells that the Spanish have left um, uh, ruined for them in order to hamper them in their ability to move around the island. They eat a lot of unripe citrus fruit. They develop stomach complaints. They, by the time they meet the troops they're in, that are sent out against them finally when they, they near the main city, they are in no condition to fight. And as they, the survivors, reboard the ships and sail to Jamaica, which is their... Um, their what they referred to at the time as a kind of consolation prize place they go that they're going to sort of lick their wounds and attempt to make something of this debacle uh edward winslow dies he dies on shipboard in the caribbean so his story to me seems a really good example of the way that Ply plymouth is connected his travels don't end in plymouth uh, but he ends up continuing to move around in this English world that's that's been created. So he's one example in this chapter that I talk about of transients. In fact, I pair him with 
Squanto um, or to Squantum, uh, who was another traveler uh, who had been kidnapped from his native New England and carried to Spain, escaped from there to England, eventually got on uh, at least two fishing voyages that were coming toward <laughs> New England. And finally, one of them got him as far as New England, where he left the, the fishing fleet and ended up making his way back down to his native village site of Pawtuxet, which is where by that time Plymouth had been founded, to discover that his family had died and uh, that most of the villagers had either died in an epidemic or been dispersed uh, to live with other native uh, peoples in the immediate region who were their relations and allies. So he's also a traveler uh, who connects Plymouth to other places. And so I use the two of them to to open the chapter of talking about people moving around the Atlantic and, and in and through, and in Winslow's case, at least out of again, Plymouth. Another uh, category I explored was ideas. And I have these different ideas of plantation, refuge, God, a New England, separatism and kingship, each with its own chapter in the book and use that to talk about ideas circulating around the Atlantic that come to Plymouth and that in some ways shape Plymouth and the interactions they have there. And again, I wanna give an example in this case, uh, the, uh, the idea of a New England. Um, and Andy said I wouldn't have uh, John Smith because I was looking at Plymouth, but in fact, he <laughs> names it New England. He uh, is there before the settlers. He has been basically kicked out of Virginia. He spends a lot of time in England trying to interest people in his wish to get back to the Americas and to be back involved in English invasions and expansion and colonization efforts. He comes on a, sh on a, on a group of ships to the region of New England uh, in the mid 1610s and eventually goes back and writes a description of New England, uh, which in effect names the region. And in that publication, he includes this book with, excuse me, this map with himself, of course, prominently displayed on it uh, in the upper corner. And he is, by using that name, he is advocating for English people to think of New England as like England, that it will be an easy place to go to, familiar. Part of the reason why he makes this argument is because if you look at a map of the Atlantic, you see England and New England are basically of a level, you know, they're on a level. And so if you don't know anything about the weather patterns, the currents, et cetera, you might think that New England would have a climate that's more like England. And so that's what he's arguing for, that that people from England will go there and they will find it very familiar. They don't, of course, once they've experienced the winters, et cetera, they realize it's not exactly the same, but he's promoting it with this idea that it'll be similar. And part of that promotion and on this map is to name place names. He claims to have gotten the names, the place names uh, that he bestows on various places in New England from the Prince Charles, who will go on to be uh, Charles I, the son of James I he says provides him with these names. And he, in the back of the book, he lists this uh, columns of the old names, that is what they were originally known by, either by the native residents or by Europeans who had visited them previously. And then the new names that he's giving them, often naming them after, say, you know, the king himself, Cape, Cape, he wants to rename Cape Cod as Cape James. Um, some of these names do actually stick. And one of them that does more or less is Plymouth itself. That is, when they get there, they they end up using that name for their village. Now, whether it's because they have Smith with them, which they do, and they, they think basically they're more or less where he labeled this on the map, 
or uh, whether they're conscious of the fact that when they don't go to the Virginia company uh, region that they were aiming for, but they go to the further north region, they've moved out from being in an area claimed by the Virginia Company of London and up into an area pl claimed by the Virginia Company of Plymouth. And so they, you know, are maybe grabbing that name for that reason. We don't really know. But this effort to make New England into an English place is one that the colonists join in. I mean, they want to have houses that are familiar, food that's familiar, clothing that's familiar. They bring these expectations that they know what life will be like and that they are hoping to recreate in some ways the life that they've known, although they do want to change it in, in certain ways as well. They have a particular version of the church they want to establish. They have other uh, concerns uh, to to do things differently, but only slightly differently. They ha you know they they want to improve in certain ways, but they don't you know they certainly don't want to make something that's entirely new and different. They don't want <laughs> to put it in 19th century terms. They don't want to found the United States. They want to found a kind of new and improved uh, version of an English society in the Americas. So this idea of a New England and of replicating what was known in England is one they're comfortable with. And then finally, I just give you the, the first map uh, of New England made after it was settled by in Plymouth and and Massachusetts, and it does in fact label Plymouth as Plymouth. Uh, it does. It keeps the name Cape Cod, though. Of course, doesn't go with John Smith on the place name he tried to impose. So, you know, this is a this is a sort of looking at ideas as they're circulating and shaping the history of early Plymouth. Professor, I've got a couple of questions to bring sure. to you. Um, and I'm going to start actually with a question from Shauna. Shauna's joining us from uh, Los Angeles, and she wonders if you could speak to the parallel between the pilgrims as economic refugees, since they originally had religious freedom under the Dutch, and the seeds of manifest destiny. <laughs> hmm. Well, thank you for that question, Shauna. So the <laughs> seeds of manifest destiny. I, I think that if we emphasize the kind of 19th century image of manifest destiny, we a little bit misunderstand the first New Englanders. They certainly think they, they certainly thought they had a right to be there. Uh, that God had supported them in their endeavors to come to this place and smiled on them and that they, you know, they believed in the idea of divine providence, that God, you know, look, was looking out for them and setting things up in a certain way that would facilitate the things he wanted to see happen. Um, or, and that's that's only part of what they believe about divine providence, but I won't go into how they explain bad things that happen at this point unless anyone's interested. But so they do have that sense of the rightness of their being there. Um, but they're also, I think, in Plymouth itself, in the very early period, they are very conscious of being very few and being very much dependent on their native neighbors. So though other things get made of this later and it's, you know, it's treated like it's all kind of sweetness and light and the, you know, all the native peoples are happy to see them. I do think that unlike some of the things that happen later and some of the ways that native peoples are treated in other places, I think in Plymouth when they're only, you know, I mean, at the end of the first winter, there's only 50 of them left. I think they're very much aware of themselves as, um, visitors in somebody else's land who they intend to stay. They think they have a right to what they've taken. But they also say things like, you know, sadly, everyone from this village had died and it was abandoned. God made it ready for us in that way. But, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't to them mean that they then have the right to everything. They're very conscious of wanting to get along with their near neighbors and of wanting to 
and and to have alliances with them and to be under their protection. They get angry with other people who come into the region right after them from England who have aggressive policies toward the natives and start, you know, fighting with them like the people at Thomas Weston's uh, settlement. They're very upset about the idea that these people will come in and antagonize the the indigenous peoples and then, you know, cause them to have wars and, you know, be in, you know, in a in a much more tense situation. It's really after 20,000 people show up in Boston and <laughs> pour in through that area and start taking over all kinds of land that the politics really shifts uh, and the settlers become much more arrogant about their rights and much more likely to intrude on native lands and to take it and to say that the uh, that any kind of aggression in response is is unwarranted and that they are you know they have the right to attack these people because they're objecting to their being there so i think um in terms of how all this fits in with economic refugees I think, you know, I think their reasons for going to New England or really trying to go to Northern Virginia is they, they're uncomfortable with being with the Dutch. I think that has as much, I mean, their their financial situation in the Netherlands is not great. And only about half of them have been in the Netherlands. The other half come directly from England. But the, to the extent that the whole idea comes out of the out of the Leiden church and is like motivated by these people from from that church they are in a financially difficult situation as refugees who don't have the language who are basically immigrants without you know much local support etc um but they begin to really fret over the fact that their children are learning dutch their children are going to marry dutch people their children are going to do what immigrants do which is they're going to become part of the host society. And it's that as much as their financial situation that motivates them to move, which is another reason why they're really interested in a New England. They think by going where they go that they're going to actually create a society that's going to be more English. It's going to be under the English king. It's going to be English speaking. They're going to be able to avoid this. Uh, absorption into Dutch culture. Mm. They don't think about the fact that they're going into native lands when they're talking about all that, which to me is fascinating. They don't think, yeah. you know, yeah. we're going to meet other people who have a different language and a different culture. Once they get there, they start fretting over it, but not in the moment that they're deciding to go. Thank you for that answer. I've got one more question for you. Uh, and then as the moderator and timekeeper, I'll remind us we have about 20 minutes left for your uh, final section. Um, this question comes from Rachel. Rachel is joining us from Illinois. And she notes that in her sophomore English class, um, she, as the teacher, uh, has her students read excerpts from Of Plymouth Plantation. And her students often remark that it seems foolish that the pilgrims would plan to land in the New World as winter was setting in. Uh, she knows that they encountered some problems early on in their journey, things like switching ships and difficulties at sea. But was that the only reason that they arrived at such an unfortunate time? <laughs> you know, timing your arrival across the Atlantic is a really tricky issue that lots of people bobble. <laughs> they they eventually learn not to sail at certain times. And, um, you know, once there's regular back and forth, uh, it becomes, you know, there's the season to go to, uh, an, to the Americas because of what the weather's going to do and such. Uh, but in this early period, it's, it's a little harder to, um you know to know and to and to time it but the real problem they have is they're running out of money hanging around in england because they they it takes too long to get that they go thinking we're going to just go and get on a ship and we're going to leave and then when they get there they're like they're having trouble with their supplies and their backers and they have various problems and then one of the ships is leaking and they have to decide who's going to go who's going to stay how much can we cram on this sh this one ship so they have all these mishaps that cause them to come when they come uh 
And then the fact that they sort of overshoot, you know, they get on the wrong side of Cape Cod, and that's not an easy navigational prospect to fix <laughs> once they realize where they are. Plus, they're pretty desperate by then. And so they just decide, you know, this is going to be, this is the best. If you read some, there's some accounts, some second, secondary sources that claim that it was like a plot on the part of the Dutch or, I mean, there's all these kind of crazy interpretations, but I think it's just not a familiar navigational point that they're, they're trying to hit. Nobody's in Delaware except the Delaware, you know? And so they, you know, I think they just between the bad, you know, the, the various things that happen on the English end of it. And then the fact that they land so late and that winter's already coming that they just decide, you know, this is we're we're just going to stay. No one wants to get you know to come, load back up and <laughs> sail yeah. off again. They're all sick and tired of it, and some of them are becoming ill. So it seems like the best prospect, except that of course they end up with you know half of them dying in that first yeah. in that first. Okay, well I'm taking too long, so I will I will pick up the pace. And just say that my last category that I look at is is things. And for those of you who are animal activists and think I shouldn't treat animals as things, let me just apologize and say I, w I went around and around about that, but I couldn't figure out how else to do it. And I really did want to talk about animals. I will give you my one example of a thing, which is tobacco. And the reason why tobacco I, I fascinates me is because it is an American plant, but they already know it when they get to Plymouth. They already have smoked it probably or drank it as they call as they call what them in there is doing with the pipe. Um and they they Leiden is a big center of, of European tobacco consumption. It's also quite popular in England. So from my point of view, it's a really fascinating example of an Atlantic commodity that's already emerged by the time they arrive in Plymouth. It's been taken to Europe. It's become popular there. And it's something that's sustaining Virginia at this time as, a, as an export crop. And it's also something that has a big ritual role in the lives of the native peoples that they encounter. So, um, you know, from my point of view, it's a really fascinating case that they uh, already know this element of America when they arrive. Although they learn other things about it as a result of what they learn from the native peoples about what they what they do with it and symbolically what it means in their society. So that was a fascinating thing that I focused on, one of the six things I focus on in the book. All right, so in the last section I want to talk a little bit about the about the um significance. And first I'd like to just return to this point of trying to escape the vignettes. And there's the rock, by the way, in its cage. Um, uh, which is a kind of seaside uh, temple uh, that you could, you stand on the edge and look down. I'm sure some of you have done it. Look down on it, at, uh, sitting on the sand below the the street level. But you know, for the book, I I wanted to escape some of these vignettes: the signing, the rock, the meal, and the debates that went around them. And so I went in a different direction and. And because of that, I was able, I think, to think about comparative opportunities, both with Roanoke, which is one that failed, and Plymouth nearly failed, and then also Virginia, which is the first one in North America that succeeded. Uh, and to think about how Plymouth is similar to and different from uh, those places. In Roanoke, they realized pretty quickly that they wanted to have families, not just men. Uh, Virginia starts off just with men in Plymouth, partly because they think they're going to Virginia. They take families. Uh, but, you know, there's elements of this that can be used in a kind of comparative uh, framework to think about how is Plymouth similar to, how is it different from various places that were also undergoing this colonization, this history of colonization, uh, interacting with the native peoples as both those in Roanoke and in Virginia did. Uh, and that's certainly a huge part of Plymouth's early history. So one thing that distinguishes uh, Plymouth is that it that people do go in family, 
units and this is an image actually that the people at what used to be called Plymouth Plantation, the Living History Museum, but is now Plymouth Pawtucket, uh, provided to me for the for the book. And the idea that they go as families is really important to the early history of Plymouth and makes it unlike other early colonies in their founding period. Um, lots of other places start as kind of military outposts and eventually turn toward what what's more of a colony or what they would have called a plantation in the sense of wanting to transplant English people to a new location. So I think the family element is is good to think about in terms of the Atlantic context. Um, this is a page from a Plymouth Plantation, William Bradford's great monograph, uh, in which he lays out the demographics of Plymouth. He is not interested in it as a demographer would be or as a person who is looking for ancestors who were on the Mayflower. What he wants to prove when he writes this account of what happened to each person on the Mayflower and their descendants, what he wants to prove is that the population was fruitful and multiplied and that the beginnings of New England came from Plymouth in spite of the fact that there were only 100 people on the Mayflower and half of them died right away. He wants to make the case that this is the beginning of Plymouth of New England's founding is that these families came and that they left, you know, and so his, his account will say, you know, this couple ended up with this many descendants as of this date. And that's really what fascinates him is the kind of demographic expansion. Plymouth is also for, good for thinking about religion. And that's, of course, the way it's mostly known in some circles is as a place that is inspired and shaped by its religion. Uh, this very fanciful image um, is of the is supposedly of the embarkation in the Netherlands, uh, in which apparently the sailors have nothing to do except create a shady spot for a um, religious ceremony uh, that's supposed to be John Robinson, who was the pastor of their church, uh, even though he didn't come all the way to the place where they embarked, leading a religious service. But Plymouth as a religious place um, and as and religion as a motivation is is important for thinking about Plymouth as we understand it today. It's also important for thinking about them as they understood themselves, which is a different which is a different issue and a great place for understanding the re the origins of the religious narrative of Plymouth. Um, is by reading Bradford's of Plymouth Plantation. He wrote it, especially the book one, as a way to explain to descendants of the first settlers that it was a place that needed to be understood in terms of its religious history. And by the way, there's a fabulous scholarly edition of Plymouth Plantation that came out for the anniversary, which I recommend to you here. Um, it's heavily annotated. It's not light reading, but if you're really interested in this, it's a great book for understanding more about what that what that history was and what that document shows. Obviously, Plymouth is also interesting in that it does have this unusual prehistory in the Netherlands, and that makes it unique among early colonial endeavors of the English in the Atlantic world, and it's something that I find particularly fascinating. Uh, and that people have uh, studied quite a bit. Um, Plymouth is, on the other hand, completely typical of colonies in that it is deeply in debt and that the debt that it carries very much shapes its early history. And how do you finance a colony? How do you make it profitable is a huge area of concern for anybody who sets up a colony and anyone who thinks they're going to make money off of a colony right away is bound to be disappointed. Finally, um, Plymouth is interesting for thinking, I think less less important for thinking about democracy as for thinking about how this group that had its battles with uh, the government of England over religion nonetheless comes to the American strand and describes itself in vehement terms, in terms of its loyalty to the monarch. 
And so I just want to highlight those elements of the Plymouth Plantation, of the, of the Mayflower Compact that are so emphasized. You know, so many of the, of the words of this very short document are given over to making that connection to the monarch in England. And that's something I actually find really fascinating, that they want to establish their loyalty and their connection to the monarchy. So those are some of the areas that I think are interesting for thinking about Plymouth as a connected place. I don't mean to minimize its importance religiously or its importance in terms of national mythology. I'm perfectly willing to acknowledge and to talk about those, but I do think the thinking of it as a connected place gives us a very different uh, perspective on it and one that we've been lacking, I think, because we've gotten so caught up in those vignettes that so much shape our history. So I'll have you notice I didn't use the term pilgrim. I have a <laughs> chapter about that uh, in the book. Uh, but uh, except, of course, it was on my orange crates and it's on this image. But I love this image because it gives the somber colors that we associate with Plymouth. So thank you very much for listening to me. and. Uh, you know, I don't know if we have any more time, but I'd be happy to ask, answer more questions if we do. Thank, thank you, Professor. We do have a few more moments, and I, I have a couple of questions that have queued up. I, I'd like to spend some time on before we say goodnight. Um, the first question I'm going to bring to you is from Ella, and Ella's wondering if you can talk some about uh, the the knowledge that the colon the colonists the colonizers had when they arrived about the ind indigenous people. What what did they know about the indigenous people before they got here? That's a really great question. They, Europeans in general, or at least educated Europeans, had been aware for a long time that there were people in the Americas, and they had been debating sort of where did they come from, how should we understand them, um, what were their lives like, how do they relate to biblical history, which has a single origin moment for all of humankind, and if that's true, then how do we explain where did they, you know, where, how did they get there, et cetera. So there's lots of this kind of discussion. There's uh, been a number of things published depicting Native peoples and their practices. Um, a lot of the conversation by 1620 had suggested that Native peoples were a more primitive form in a, you know, in a more primitive stage of civilization. And that's, I mean, that's obviously prejudice and, and, and suggesting something negative about them and their social organization. But let me point out that it's not, in fact, racist in any simple sense. It's, it's more of a sense of like, we used to run around wearing skins half naked hunting and and that's where they are now and in fact john white who went to um who went to roanoke drew a picture of a native man and then alongside a, of an ancient briton who was painted blue and was you know very much in a, in a kind of similar mode to the native man that he was depicting and the point was yes we're clearly superior but they could advance to where we are. Mm -hmm. So they go, I think, expecting to find, you know, gratitude because they're bringing this better version of religion. They're bringing a better version of how to live. But they're not thinking, you know, these people are irredeemable and, and you know, entirely different from us. They they think it's more culture than it that explains the differences, as opposed to, you know, the way by the 19th century these things would be talked about in much more, you know, biologically determinist and racist mm -hmm. terms. Uh, great. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from Molly. Molly's in Bowling Green, Ohio, and she's wondering if you could speak to some uh, to the to the role of women in the Plymouth Plantation? Oh, that's such a great question. I started the book with the chapter on wives because I was trying to think how to organize this. So you started with the most basic essential things. And it seemed to me that wives were the most basic essential things. I mean, I made the point already that they think in terms of they're going to go as families, they're going to establish a community. And and 
what in order to do that you have to have wives um you, in order to have a household you have to have wives because the gender division of labor in these societies whether you're in europe or you're in the americas is that women have are taught certain skills and men learn other skills so a functional household, which is an economic unit, has to have both sets of those skills. You can't manage just with men. You can't manage just with women. So they do a really fascinating thing when they first get there and so many people, you know, they need to build shelters. The men sit down and decide, we will only, in effect, build as many shelters as we have adult women who are wives. And we will sort the unattached men, because there's a lot of unattached men, into those households. So what they're basically deciding is that the women are going to manage, are going to like feed and clothe and care for whoever is sent to live in their house. So not just their husband, not just their children, not just their own servants, but whatever other random men are assigned to them. And there's a little bit of a revolt which I find really fascinating. It's like they didn't think, should we ask them? Should we tell them? Should we get their opinion? They just did it. And then they're sort of surprised. Bradford is a little like amazed that the women find this problematic. So I think that I love that story because it really gets at the, the how essential they were just to the social and economic functioning of the colony. And they have, obviously, they have roles in terms of uh, religiously and in terms of uh, educating the children. Most of the women who were there would have known how to read. Certainly that would have been true of all the Leiden women because it's essential. You know, if you're in a Reformed Christian church like they were, they would have learned how to read so they could read their Bible. Um, so they would have been able to to assist with the basic education of their children as Christians. Uh, and, you know, obviously, I mean, their their role was you couldn't imagine these, this functioning as a colony without the wives. And so that's really why I started with them. Great. Thank you. We've got two more questions before we conclude tonight. Uh, the next question comes from Ruth, Ruth, uh, just outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, you teased us for this a little bit earlier and you mentioned venison. But tell us more about what was on that uh, original feast <laughs> table. Okay, so the food that the, that we eat for Thanksgiving, setting aside like whatever little additions your family does, but the kind of classic 19th century, um, you know, turkey stuffing cranberries, that is 19th century New England regional cuisine. You know, that's what they ate in the 19th century. And all the maple syrup or you know, whatever, all the like flavorings of the, of the, of the sweet potatoes and stuff. That's all what they ate in New England. So it was a kind of regional fall celebration meal that came to be associated with, you know, our celebration of that holiday. But in, in the, in probably September of 1621 when they have this moment of this this uh this harvest gathering uh which is described in one source uh they are going to only be able to eat what they have there what they're able to produce and they have they have some animals with them although they haven't gotten uh, they, they probably have pigs right away when they arrive, and a lot of the excavation at Plymouth is of, you know, pig bones. Uh, they they don't have beef yet. Uh, they're not really great hunters, those Plymouth um, men. They do bring fowling pieces so that they can shoot at... Uh, so that they can shoot at birds and they do when in the fall they they are able to bring down a lot of birds because New England is so full of of what you know fowl that that they probably are able to do that pretty easily because I, I they describe it as difficult to miss basically but 
you know, the idea of hunting turkey and bringing in turkey is one that they they never talk about. And I, an archaeologist told me they never unearthed any turkey bones at, at where they've done the excavation sites. The turkeys we buy for our Thanksgiving meal are are altered in order, you know, they're bred to have those big grass. But that's not a very meaty bird. Um so they would have had corn. They would have had the venison that is described as having been supplied by the um, by the native people who the the ninety warriors who show up when they start shooting off their guns in celebration. The warriors may have shown up with less than friendly or at least curious uh, expectations, but then they end up staying for this party. Um, and then whatever else they're able to grow locally. They they report a lot of not being very successful with the stuff that they bring from England to grow. So they're probably eating corns, beans, and, squa and squash, which is what the native peoples grow, mm -hmm. and then the venison, um, and, and poss quite possibly pork. Fantastic. Last question, Professor. Um, I suspect I assume that you'll have your own Thanksgiving celebration next week. I hope that you spend time with family and friends and celebration and gratitude. What, what's the one thing on your Thanksgiving table that you just can't stand? You just wish it weren't there and you always pass it by. <laughs> oh, that is a great question. Yeah. Let me think. Um, Jello hmm. mold? Yeah, we don't do Jello mold in my family. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I make a really fabulous spicy cranberry relish Yum. that is not for everybody and so somebody in my extended family usually smuggles in one of those cans of cranberry sauce that yeah. <laughs> comes out in the shape of a can i right. definitely pass that by <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us tonight for giving uh, us insights on what is the 40th uh, 400th anniversary i should say um, and we appreciate everything that you've shared with us. Please have a wonderful holiday. Thank you again for joining us, Professor. Oh, I was happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And I want to thank everyone in our audience for joining us tonight for this webinar. Uh, please do follow the National Humanities Center on our social media, particularly our Twitter feed for upcoming uh, events and opportunities. And I hope you have uh, a good holiday week as well. Our next webinar is not next week, but rather scheduled for November 30th. This is a rescheduled webinar from earlier in the fall. I'll be joined by Ayanna Thompson from Arizona State to discuss decolonizing the Shakespeare curriculum. Please have a wonderful uh, last day of the week tomorrow at school, a great holiday next week. We'll see you two weeks from now. And until then, uh, we appreciate your, your attendance and we'll see you next time. Thanks everyone.